All right. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. It's the MCLD's pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight, Tim Miller. I'm going to give the intro. Uh, Tim is a physical education and physiotherapy technology teacher at Dawson College in Montreal. Uh, he specializes in physical activity uh, education, focusing on physical literacy and the importance of confidence and competence in movement. Working in an interdisciplinary health team at the Jewish General Hospital, Tim helped coach overweight and inactive youth towards a healthier lifestyle. Tim is the father of three young children, and it's our pleasure to have you here, Tim. So it's yours. Thank you very much. If I was to add one more sentence to that, yes, it would also say that Tim is exhausted. Oh. <laughs> Not today specifically, but just, you know, yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully that uh, everyone feels that as well. Um, in the best way, exhausted. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Okay. Am I good? We're good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So we're going to dive right into it. I have about an hour of a presentation. I did a bit of a dry run, uh, but I can get a bit long winded. It's the teacher in me. So I'm going to keep track of the time uh, and make sure that, uh, that we stick to our time tonight. Um, so bear with me here as I start the process of doing share screen. So someone stop me if you can't see uh, what I'm showing you right now. So uh, welcome everyone that's here. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a busy time of the year. It's a busy time of life. It's a hot day today. So I uh, hope you're comfortable. I hope uh, the kids are asleep, cross our fingers, uh, if they're at home with you now and, um, and that you're ready and, enjoy, and going to enjoy the next hour. It's gonna be fun. Fun is in the title. I'm hoping it's gonna be light. It's gonna be well uh, received and you'll get an idea of simple at home things you can do uh, with the kids to get them active while living uh, in, a, in a situation that we're in during these COVID times. So um, thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, I want to start off by just showing this, uh, this one picture uh, that I think kind of captures my feeling, people's feelings, potentially uh, a roller coaster. Uh, and there's a few reasons why I'd wanted to start with, uh, with this picture tonight. Namely, firstly, I should say, uh, is because uh, I wanted you to maybe tap in a little bit as we go through tonight into your inner child, if you will, and to the fun side that you have. Uh, we all are, are all born creative, uh, but it's over time kind of push some of that creativity to the side, depending. And, uh, and so I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward, because some of the games and activities I'm going to show uh, involve creativity. And so you have it in you. How about that? Uh, second thing is, and more importantly, to me, this is a really good comparison to what we've all been through uh, as a community uh, across the globe. Seven billion people have gotten on a roller coaster together with no idea of any of the turns or shifts uh, or twists. Uh, and so like riding a roller coaster, we are riding the wave uh, of this situation as best as possible. Parents do this on a daily basis, regardless of COVID. There's lots of adaptation and uh, improvisation, if you will. Uh, and anyone working with kids tends to do the same. Uh, and so add COVID to the mix and you're now getting on a more exciting and thrilling roller coaster, yet uh, potentially one that we all did not request to be on. Uh, it might feel as though we're in a bit of a flat right now and it's enjoy. Uh, I, I think the best way to say this is that it's welcomed, uh, that we're three months in and we're starting to learn how to live with it. Um, but yet there were times, the two loops, I guess, could be those first few months um, where things were just sort of, um, you're trying to figure things out. And as a family, when you work with kids, routine is huge, in my opinion, and I'm sure many of you can agree. And so while you're adapting to all the changing uh, aspects to the COVID situation, uh, we were constantly trying to find a routine. I know in my house, uh, we try to strive on that routine because it keeps our kids, you know, in line and, and focused. And so um, it was that, uh, it was very difficult for sure. And I think the next thing to say along with this introduction picture is to really talk about, uh, there we go, uh, show some more images of potential uh, ideals, if you will, and maybe moments where you felt like your family 
or again, if I'm speaking, let's say to parents or anyone working with kids that it would run as smoothly as this picture here, when in fact, many times it felt a little bit more like this picture here. These are all from Google. Uh, potentially this picture here could describe one day or a few days within the, the COVID situation and or potentially what you may have thought you'd be able to do lying in bed on a Saturday morning, yet by midday, you may have felt more like this, uh, depending on the situation, depending on the day. Uh, this as well could have been one of the days that you had, and then this could be the next. So for me, the other thing I really wanted to start with at this point, uh, being a parent and working with kids, is to be kind to yourself in these types of times. Um, be respectful, be kind, be empathetic, uh, and forgive yourself. We are all not perfect. There is no way to know what was ahead in the heat of the past three months. Um, and so I'd like to start off with that sort of sentiment, know that it's gonna be okay. We're all gonna get through this together as a community and nights like tonight are ways that we can do it. So thank you for having me. I'm quite excited to, to get through this. And, uh, and I wanted to sort of set the tone of, of, uh, of the spiel by kind of saying, give yourself a hug and maybe a little sip of wine too. Okay. Lastly, I wanted to start off by uh, just kind of letting you know where I come from uh, in a sense of how, you know, my background and my experiences uh, have lined up with uh, the topic tonight. So I'm not going to go through each thing in depth. This is not really a job interview in a sense, uh, but I did want to highlight a few things that I think, you know, helped shape a little bit of my uh, expertise, if you will, in, uh, in this section or this uh, subject. Um, I was a camp counselor for 10 years, and at the time, as a teenager, I had no idea the skills that would be developed in uh, creativity, in adapting on the fly, uh, and you know, connecting with all kinds of kids uh, from all sectors uh, and all types of uh, learning abilities. And so as a camp counselor, you're constantly focused on making sure that the things that you've planned for the day are fun, uh, yet structured. And I think through the 10 years of doing that uh, have really sharpened my skills and I've been able to carry that forward as a teacher and as a parent. And, um, and so it was an invaluable experience for sure. And so I, I give a lot of uh, appreciation to camp counselors. They're not, it's not an easy position. You're often dealing with many children, uh, all kinds of abilities, uh, physical, mental, et cetera. And uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, it, with not much uh, support and help. So you, uh, the camp counselors out there are people I think about often, uh, maybe not so much right now, because I know some of the camps aren't able to run, but uh, generally speaking, I feel very, very thankful that I was able to do that. That guided me a little bit into physical education and I've applied a lot of the things I've learned there in, as a phys ed teacher at Dawson uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, being a parent as well, I feel like uh, given the situation uh, that we've dealt with, has forced me to really think on the, on the fly as well and utilize some of those skills that I've had. And so the last thing I really wanted to bring up uh, that I wanted to share as an experience that I've had um, is there's an organization that I worked for for many years called ACC Sports and we focused a lot, it's a local West Island organization, now called actually Champions for Life. And we focused a lot on physical literacy. It's something that I knew uh, through school and have applied it uh, at work but really de delved or dove into it a little bit more uh, with ACC and, uh, and physical literacy is what I'm gonna bring up in the first uh, section today. So a mix of everything else uh, that I've had in my life, I guess at this point, uh, this is where I've landed uh, with this topic tonight. And I think, uh, like I said, I'm quite excited to share. I may take a quick sip of water. It's been a while since I've taught, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, just so that we're aware of what's coming up, because uh, I always feel that's important. Now that I've done the little intro that I've uh, planned, I really wanted to get into two quick sort of revisits on why move and how to move and focus in on kids and kids with ADD, ADHD, um, and focus uh, a little bit on the preamble there, and then get into the bigger section here, part number three, on how to move during a pandemic, which is what we discussed as uh, the topic tonight. And then end with a little bit of a toolkit on uh, things that you can do, you know, in a sense tomorrow, really consolidate some of the information so you can walk away with some things that you can do, you know, tomorrow. So this is sort of what's expected tonight. So section number one, um, movement. So something that uh, you may have heard, I'm sure many times is physical activity. Sometimes you may have heard exercise. My personal feeling is I like the word movement. It's a way, great way to describe 
anything that involves moving your body. As humans, it's natural. It requires many of the systems of the human body and we are born to move. Movement doesn't mean lace up your exercise uh, shoes and go out for a 20 minute jog, nor does it mean you know lift weights or play soccer or play hockey. Movement is just make your body move through space. And so to me, it's a really great way to, to summarize all kinds of movements for all kinds of bodies. Uh, and so it is a natural thing. So something I feel like you're aware of, um, but I really just wanted to lay a bit of some groundwork here uh, and give you, I guess, my spin on things. Regular movement, as you probably are aware, helps improve children's overall health across all facets of wellness. So in the world of physical education and health, we talk a lot about dimensions of wellness. Uh, and right now we've ended with six. These do sometimes evolve over the years, but right now uh, we've been using six as our uh, dimensions of wellness. And so if I related to COVID times, one of the first things that, uh, that I thought of, I remember the dates very well, March the 12th, March the 13th, uh, were the first few days, I guess, in Montreal specifically that um, things really changed. And over that weekend, there was so much unknown and so much uh, going on in the news and everything. And so you were adapting. And my first instincts, obviously, are from my own family and loved ones, but as well as kids in general across the board, both my students who are a little bit older in their teens and young adult age, as well as youth who um, I knew right away at this point, given a massive change in routine and the amount that families lean on community to keep kids active, both in school and out of school, uh, I knew there'd be a big impact on physical activity and specifically emotional um, impact for sure. One of the things I can say quickly here, uh, being a coach this season for my daughters, one of our uh, kids ring at teams is uh, that emotional impact even I felt uh, because things couldn't wrap up like they normally do you couldn't tie the season up with a bow and you know have the banquet and give out the awards and celebrate what was a, a great season of you know having fun on the ice and learning uh, to play and to move so uh, on skates so um, one of the things I thought of right away was that emotional state of, of kids and so I think that's probably played a little bit of uh, a part on everyone's mind throughout the three months, four months that we've been in this situation um, because it does regular movement does impact these six dimensions of wellness. So I think, um, I think that's what I wanted to kind of capture with this as just a re refresher on, on the importance of regular movement, a little science. I can't help it. Um, I just want to revisit and relate it again to, to, to students, to youth, uh, who have lots of energy, generally speaking, uh, but also ADHD kids who do have extra energy uh, to expend. And so to me, I'm just using this slide. This is from a YouTube page. It's a screenshot uh, of Cognito YouTube. Very good YouTube uh, site, by the way, if you're looking for a little, you know, five, 10 minute clips about different things in science. And so again, I'll just tweak the exercise word to movement. Um, we, in order to move, we need to move muscles. Uh, which moves joints, which moves our body, and therefore we need some muscular contraction. That does require a lot of energy and therefore requires oxygen. Um, through cellular respiration, we are able to move our muscles. Along with that, because we need more oxygen in our system, our heart has to pump more, and the rate of breathing has to be more frequent and increased in volume. And these three things, contraction of muscle, expansion of, of uh, lungs, and more uh, increased heart rate does require more energy. So movement requires energy, but movement expends energy. So it's a double-edged, good double-edged sword in a sense, because those that have lots of energy, everyone needs to move, but those that have lots of energy have a way to diminish or get rid of a little bit of that, little bit of that energy through movement. And so I think of, my own life, I think of kids I've worked with, there are kids who have endless energy and we can spend our entire day trying to expend that energy like you would a young uh, uh, puppy in a sense uh, and trying to get them dog tired, if you will. And, um, and sometimes it just, somehow they still have more. And so I wanted to revisit a little bit of, that it does require energy to move. It's important to move. And what a great way for kids with lots of energy to expend energy is to have them move. And I hope that um, you're not saying, well, duh, Tim, I hope you're saying, yes, we understand. Now tell me how. So here we go. Normally, 
to have children move. Uh, what we do is a community of coaches and physical education teachers and anyone working with kids in, uh, in general is to have kids and children move more with confidence and competence. So these are two key words that uh, we often use when talking about movement and movement education is to work and have them improve their confidence and their competence. Two words I think that can relate to many things when you're learning a new skill. If I think of learning an instrument, you have to have the confidence to be able to play and obviously the competence to be able to play the guitar. So we use the same words when we talk about movement. This is what has created this, if I use the word movement here, I hope you understand it to be in a different context, movement towards increasing the physical literacy of youth in Canada and across the globe. Um, and I believe and trust that you all understand the word literacy. And if I use it really quick in the world of learning how to read, the first thing you learn to do is learn the uh, letters. Then you put some letters together and they become the syllables. Syllables then become words and phrases and paragraphs and then therefore novels. And so we are really great at doing that in our education system, both in both languages or many languages. What we're working on a lot is doing the same thing with our physical uh, movement system and so in the education system. So in physical education class or on in the field with a coach or whatever it might be in the, you know, um, the karate club with the karate instructor, teaching youth the physical literacy movements, the letters of movement, the, the syllables of movement, so that they can better put together the words and the phrases and the paragraphs of movements as they age. Why? Because through research, it's been determined, scientifically proven that when there is more confidence and competence in movement, people will become more active for life. And knowing how movement helps all aspects of wellness and obviously helps use most of the systems of our body, the interest is there to move and stay active for life. So we work a lot with physical literacy in physical education and as a coach. And so you might be sitting there wondering, well, what are the letters of physical movement, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, I was so perfect there. I thought I was going to be perfect. I just wanted to mention one thing and then I'll come back to that point. Just wanted to show you this quick. Uh, so you orient yourself and you're probably thinking, okay, I just want the games, Tim, get to the games. They're coming. So the physical literacy is really important for ages. I'm just going to say 12 and under. Um, then they get into something that we call active for life. So I don't really know everyone that's here in the room tonight or who'll be listening after. So I'm going to trust that you're able to figure out where the demographic of, and age of, of, of youth that you're targeting or that you're working with. You can't, don't, not you can't, you can go back stages. It's not that you have to stay within a certain stage uh, within that age category. And this all may not make a lot of sense to you right now. And it's not the, the point of the, uh, of the presentation. What I really wanted to kind of enforce here quickly is just that we really gotta, we really gotta, that's not very good English. We really should be focusing on physical literacy at an early age to get them to be able to have confidence and confidence through movement. Yet, people learn how to move at all at, uh, stages of their life and can learn the physical literacy movements as they, uh, at any point. So um, the system is set up for this is what I'm saying. What I was going to get at, the, what are the letters essentially of movement? And so as a collective of uh, scientists uh, in this realm of science, we've um, landed on grouping them in three sections. So locomotion skills, things like running, jumping, hopping, uh, crossovers, et cetera. Object manipulation, so throwing, catching, kicking, volleying, so on. And then stability movements. So anything that involves you know, dodging, landing, spinning, twisting, uh, a fancy word called evading. So trying to you know, move your body as creatively and as you can to evade a tag or evade a tackle, uh, whatever it might be. And so these are the physical literacy movements. And if you put a few of them together, well, all of a sudden now you're throwing a fastball at the pitcher's mound or you're, you know, hitting a birdie back playing badminton. Uh, and so this is what we work on as a community. Yet, and here's where I'm getting into part number three. Uh, we do this as a collection of, of specialists for the kids in, in all the communities. And we try and sneak them in as best as possible. We're not going to say, okay, kids, we're going to only work on our hopping today. 
Well, no, what we're going to do is play a game of tag and then incorporate hopping into this, into the activity. Or we're going to play, you know, we're going to work on volleying a little bit, but instead of playing volleyball, we're going to play a version of soccer that requires you to volley instead. And so we do this as sort of sneakily as possible and, uh, and incorporate it for the youth to be able to apply it uh, to learn and have more confidence and confidence in their movement. Yet, when we get, get into a situation where we are with COVID, a lot of that support system that we have in these communities isn't there to do so in the same way. Yes, we tried, uh, in, if I speak from an aspect of school, there was definitely some efforts for sure in the right direction to replace the physical um, space, the gymnasium home with success um, as best as we could. Same thing with coaching, same thing with uh, training, whatever it might have been, whatever realm of movement the kids may be participating in. I can say my daughter uh, was in a hip hop uh, studio and they did a fabulous, fabulous job of doing online uh, and still following the same sort of feeling of what their services were and what the goal of the class was, uh, but yet online. And this is with six and seven year olds. So there was a, lots of efforts in the right direction, yet we're at a situation where we can't lean on these people like we normally do. And we know it takes a village to raise kids. We know it takes a village to raise all kids. It doesn't matter what the situation is. And we live in fabulous areas where there's lots of community support, lots of parks, lots of fields. We were just talking about outdoor pools at the beginning of the session and, uh, and specifically in uh, the West, West Island area of Montreal, uh, the access to uh, the outdoor pools uh, is, is fabulous. Um, and the pool community as a whole in the summer is, is always there with great support. Yet, given the COVID situation, we cannot uh, lean on them as much. And we, are, we know it takes a village to do what we need to do for our kids. And obviously we can't right now because of this bugger. Um, and so we're trying to pivot as best as possible and incorporate uh, new ways of, of doing things and finding that new normal and living with the, with the virus, as they say. And so um, what, we, uh, what I feel comfortable to say is, as a community we, of coaches and physical education instructors, uh, and anyone working with kids in movement, we want to avoid this as much as possible. I'm very sensitive to this. I have, like was mentioned in the beginning, three young kids, uh, lots of uh, work um, at the time when the semester was in, lots of work uh, requirements and commitments that needed to get done. My wife is a teacher as well, so same thing with her. Um, and so there were times when we were struggling like crazy and trying to figure out what to do with the three kids to keep them safe, keep them alive, keep the house uh, without getting completely burnt down and yet be able to do the work commitments that we had, which Murphy's Law always happened to be at the same time. And so we, we like I said at the beginning, we've, we've given ourselves a hug and we've said we've made it through um, and we're gonna find systems that will work um, and readjust as the things, as the, the, the you know, everything evolves. Um, but as a community, I think, and as a parents ourselves, and I'm sure many others, we want to alleviate this as much as possible uh, and this as much as possible. Um, getting to the point where we're, we're leaning heavily on inactivity and sedentary lifestyles. Yet, we're faced with a major, major roadblock uh, when we have pandemics uh, that we've learned, you know, without access to parks, uh, without access to, access to fields, and yet we still have to be able to do some sort of work. Uh, we're made faced with this in a way I felt at the time potentially, and hopefully after tonight, uh, less of a roadblock, more of a detour, um, which was you have a meeting, whatever platform the meeting is on, because in my world, it continually switched. Uh, and you have about 10 minutes before the meeting starts. And it's like, what do we do? We have X, Y, Z, many of kids um, at home or wherever the living situation is. And um, it's that predicament of what do we do? So. I'm going to start sharing some of the games that I've come up with and some of the activities that I've uh, thought of over the past few weeks, some of which I've done, some of which I've done in the past, some of which I've used the internet to, to, uh, to look up. Um, and so I can't take complete ownership over all of these. It's often a, uh, a sharing community. I've been a little bit on some of the other teachers that I've worked with. 
over the years to uh, come up with these kinds of things. Um, and a lot of these we've used with ACC Sports uh, in designing the, the approach to, to, that, uh, to that program, for that organization. Um, and I've highlighted a specific situation, but I think the games and activities that I'm about to share um, can be done anytime. It doesn't have to be in that unique situation. It doesn't have to be just the kids playing alone. It can be you with the kids, uh, with the children. Um, I know that the other MCLD or one of the other MCLD webinars was the importance of play, and I'm a firm believer of that as well. Um, like I mentioned, we all have that inner child in us somewhere, and it's our kids that typically can bring it out. Um, and so I encourage that as well. So I'm given this unique situation of, you know, you got 10 minutes before some sort of meeting and what do we do? But again, I think, uh, use it at, at, uh, at your, you know, uh, at your best interest of, of when you believe these activities can be done. Um, and so here's my solution. Again, I'm one person. This is not necessarily rocket science, but I believe it's going to be helpful for you in a sense tomorrow if this is your situation tomorrow. So after thinking for a few weeks now when I've been mowing the lawn or doing whatever, if I've had a moment to, to think, uh, I came up with a sort of a five-step recipe to follow. I use the word recipe mainly just to follow a, a, you know, a, a step-by-step -step process to make a decision on what can I provide for my children uh, to be able to be physically active within the space that we have. Um, to have some sort of movement in the day. Um, so this is what I've come up with. The first thing that we always asked ourselves as parents was how much time do I have or do I need them to be doing something? Um, and so when I say have, I really mean how much time do we have if we're doing this together or how much time do we have before you know, dinner or whatever it might be. But if I mean how much time do we need, it's pretty much how long is this meeting going to be? Um, and how able am I to move in and out of the meeting if I need to? For me, this one is a big thing. What mood is my kid in or are my kids in? Um, and if I take the context out of you working with your kids at home and I take, put it into the context of you working with your kids that are uh, in the, the, uh, at a school or at a community center, whatever it is, what mood are they in? What mood are they in to tell you what activity potentially they might be interested in? Um, I'm a firm believer that no one knows your kids more than you do. And so I'm not here to tell you that you should do this activity at this time and that activity at that time. To me, it's really based on the user, the, the kid, the, the children. And so it really depends on what mood to me that they're in. The next thing that the five steps, step number three, what kind of supervision do I need and can I provide and do they need uh, for this activity? Um, and can I provide it? So depending on if I need to be close or far, depending if I need to be able to leave the meeting and come back, um, what kind of supervision is needed? What equipment do we have? And where are they going to be doing this? So these are the five things that I felt like would be a good step-by-step -step process to guide you to potentially which activity uh, or activities to, to sort of lay out in a sense or which activities to, to set up or um, you know, kind of you know, coach a little bit for the kids to do. Um, and so here's the big table. If I was, um, uh, I guess, in the business of making magnets, <laughs> I'd make a magnet and throw this up on the fridge. Um, and so, like I said, I had uh, been thinking about this for a few weeks now and I've narrowed down to 18 games, 18 activities uh, that I feel like uh, I chose based on the five things before to give a wide variety of locations a wide variety of equipment but not too wide um, the different levels of supervision that might be needed different areas of the house different moods um, and different times some of these could last all day some of them may just need to be 15 minutes um, and so i've come down with this so you'll see that i'll go through a good chunk of them uh, i may go through them a little bit quicker depending on what they are i think an example would be balloon volleyball. I feel comfortable to say that with a picture or two, they'll have a good understanding of what that means. But some things may seem a little bit, a little bit more weird, weird or obscure or creative, like stair ball potentially, or tree ball. So um, I've divided them based on whether they can be done inside or outside, whether you have a small, medium, or large space inside and where outside. What I feel like are the ages that these activities could be done doesn't mean they have to be. You know your kids more than anyone. So 
Um, if you have a 12 year old and they're doing the alphabet challenge, that's okay. If you have a four year old and they're doing the alphabet challenge, that's okay too. So it really is just a bit of a guideline of where I feel potentially uh, the age uh, demographic could be doing that activity. And then obviously the names of the games, which some may sound, uh, like I said, familiar and straightforward and some may seem a bit uh, obscure. As I'm about to go through these, I did wanna, didn't say this and I wanted to, um, if there are questions, if there are uh, comments, if I'm going too fast, uh, if you can't hear me, um, anything that requires you to intervene, please do so. Roberta will be uh, helping me out a little bit with the chat. You can use the chat line um, to do that. If there are other ideas, um, regressions or progressions to change or modify the game, or if someone's done this, these activities before and has a really great suggestion, I think this is a great platform uh, to share. So the side conversation can be ongoing as I'm talking and I think that that's a nice way uh, to, to elaborate or to you know, collaborate and make you know, more of, the, of, of the, the, the session tonight. Like I said, I'm, I'm just one brain. So it was, it'd be a great opportunity to get all our brains together and, and really come up with, who knows, maybe even a 19th activity. So uh, here we go. We will get in to the, perfect stuff. So I'm managing the chat as well, as much as I can. It's been a few weeks since I've been teaching on a Zoom uh, platform, so, okay. So if you're living in an inside small space, uh, or you only have a little bit of space uh, that you have at the moment, uh, mini hand hockey, uh, a really great activity for dribbling, um, a really great activity that doesn't require a lot of equipment. Um, so you see here with a the picture, there's a pair of socks. You can have you know, a little cone or whatever it might be, a little space that you need for a net. And then you use your hands as the hockey stick, you use your pair of socks or tennis ball as the puck and you, you know, go at it. And um, I can say that this is an activity that I've done as a kid with my siblings. And uh, we used to play it so much that we had specific mini hockey pants, <laughs> because if we were in shorts in our basement, the rug would give us that rug kind of carpet burn. And so if we knew we were gonna be playing this, we'd play it for a long time with many uh, tournaments, if you, if, uh, if you can imagine. And uh, we'd have to make sure that we had the right equipment, the right pair of pants, which were just old, you know, pants, but had really good uh, thick, I guess, cotton so that you didn't scrape up your knees. All that to say, little aside, uh, mini hockey, great activity for the kids uh, with not a lot of space and can be played for a long time to regress it. I think a sock is a really great thing for younger kids. A tennis ball could be used for older to, to progress it. And then again, for me, adding a level of a game or a tournament, you know, keeping track of the score, uh, or having multiple players right now you can see there's two but you know if there's four that you have access to or that you can you know somehow have um, then that's a great way to add a layer to it next alphabet challenge this is a great activity for an individual uh, person individual kid you need a bit of construction paper and again an old pair of socks hopefully not too smelly and uh, again what's nice about this one is uh, and I, I feel um, okay to say this as well with the situation that we had with COVID. Um, I know I'm talking to many family members as well as uh, with kids as well as you know cousins or neighbors with kids. We all did what we could do and each family could do different things and um, while some were able to just manage you know having some homeschooling some were not and as a prof as a teacher I think we were all safe to say do what you can we were all in that situation and so this is a nice one because it kind of tackles a little bit of both. There's some alphabet learning as well as some movement learning. So um, this one, the letters are written out on construction paper. The size of the construction paper is up to you. Smaller is a little bit more difficult, a little bit more advanced. Bigger is a little bit easier. Um, and so you take the pair of socks and you throw and you try and hit the specific letters of the word you're trying to spell. And what was fun about this one, I did this one with the kids at one point. And what was fun about this one is we ended up doing a secret code kind of way to do it. So we didn't know specifically what they were going for. And I don't have very old children, so their spelling is not really there either. So it was definitely a bit of a, uh, a yes, I helped them. And then I acted surprised when I cracked the code that I, of the word that I created for them. 
but uh, I could see that being something with kids that know and are confident with their spelling um, to be fun. Uh, and again, for me, the variation of the size of paper, the space that you're throwing, the distance that you're throwing all makes for a different uh, aspect to the game or a different level of difficulty. Um, you know, you can change these up for numbers, you can change them up for all sorts of things I think that uh, could be fun. And again, it's really good for object manipulation skill of, of, of throwing. It could be overhand, underhand, whatever it might be. Um, the next one, I can't take ownership over this one. This has been around for many decades. It did take a bit of a increase in popularity during COVID as many celebrities on Instagram um, took the floor is lava challenge. And, uh, and so yet it's really great. And uh, maybe your kids did do this, um, which, which is fabulous. It could, again, what I like is it's one or more. You don't need a lot of setup. It could be your living space that you have uh, with a couch or two. Uh, whatever it might be it could be you know ta kitchen table it could be kitchen chairs or what was nice about this picture that i found on the internet construction paper so it was sort of set up maybe it's set up for the whole week again this is a little bit of a younger kid doing this but i feel that the floor is lava contest or competition or challenge lasted uh for a while as well as was for all ages and so what's really great about this is uh really great for stability really great for balance uh, and again, really creative um, uh, things that can be done with the setup of the space. And again, doesn't require a lot of setup. So again, if I think of a situation where you don't have a lot of time and you know uh, the, the you need you know ten minutes maybe or whatever it might be, you know, floor is lava, and the kids could just potentially busy themselves safely uh, and be moving for ten minutes. Um, and so this is sort of where the inside small kind of space games uh, are with the variations that I'm kind of mentioning uh, as I go. So now if I slip to the next section, the medium space, again, doesn't mean that you have to do it in a medium space. You can modify it if it, you only have a certain amount, a little bit smaller, or obviously do it a little bit bigger. Um, but I'm thinking of a space that, um, that many of you may have if you're in a condo, an apartment, um, that might be needed to, to complete the activity. So this is a, a fun one that, um, I don't worry about this one, maybe just from, uh, you know, fitness and obstacle course and combining the two. Um, you'll see there's a lot of painter's tape um, in the activities, which is a great tool. It is recyclable tape, which is great and uh, fairly inexpensive at the dollar store. And uh, really great because it's bright, it's green, typically means something fun is happening. And so you set up, and this is what's nice about this one, this could be set up for a whole week, in my opinion, uh, or longer, and you can modify the stations uh, as the kids are interested. You know, you can incorporate more fitness kind of things or more creative kind of movements. Um, so fitness could be jumping jacks, burpees, lunges, squats, whatever, but or fun, you know, dancing on the spot, you know, doing the floss dance move that all the kids know how to do. Um, for 30 seconds or whatever it might be. Um, and so this is sort of what it might look like. You see there's sort of this path, I guess, as you, as you can see. Uh, it could be a circuit if you have that uh, sort of circular layout to your house where you might be able to run around stairs or whatever it might be. Um, or you just have something where you can go to the end of a room and back in a medium kind of setup where you have stations written out in painter's tape on the ground, they complete the exercises and they move on. Again, to regress it, I think for me changing up the exercises to be more age appropriate or progressing it, making it a bit harder would be, you know, adding more repetitions or making it longer or even adding the level of timing, this, timing the kids and seeing where they're at that given day. And maybe they can, um, you know, see if they can get a little bit quicker next time or by incorporating maybe backwards running instead of forwards running, etc. So there's ways to modify the setup to incorporate different kinds of games, which in the world of physical education, we just sort of, you know, add a level or a layer or progress it. But in the world of children, in my opinion, it feels like a brand new game. You know, you play telephone tag or toilet tag. It's still tag. I know that, but they think it's a completely new game. So, um, hopefully you're getting a bit of that uh, idea as I share and continue to share the, um, the games as we go. 
So lasers is the next one. Um, I think this one is uh, another one that I'll explain. I'm going to speed it up soon. So if you're kind of like, oh my God, he's going to go through each one like this. I wanted to go through the first few and then I think it'll be quicker as I go because you'll get an idea, I think, uh, from the picture. So uh, lasers is a great one. Again, one or more. Again, painter's tape is all you need. And using a staircase, using a hallway, using a space that you have uh, set up tape that can go across um, the space and uh, have the kid go through or the children go through the, the, the lasers and without getting touched by one. And um, the variation is great because you can make the lasers really close if they're a little bit more old or really far apart if they're a little bit younger. Um, you can time them. You can make treasures that they have to get. Um, they have to go maybe all the way there and back. There could be music. One of the things that we did, because uh, I did do this one, um, is I filmed it, which was something I try not to do too much, uh, having you know the, my device around the kids as much as possible, but I couldn't help myself with a bit of that Mission Impossible music. And uh, it was a video that the kids watched a few times uh, back because um, they liked, it looked really cool. And so, um, and so yeah, this was a, a great uh, activity that we left up for a few days. And then I walked right through it, <laughs> going to get the dog uh, let the dog out before going to bed and it was dark in the hallway. <laughs> so I was not as good as the kids uh, in going through the lasers that night, but I fixed it before they woke up. So luckily nothing was, uh, was lost. Um, okay, I'm moving along. Uh, balloon volleyball, I, like I said, this is one I feel is pretty straightforward. You know, you take the chairs, you take some painter's tape and a balloon and they go at it. And what's great is Typically with a balloon, there's less damage. Uh, and uh, it, for younger kids, their ability to volley a balloon is there. A volleyball or a beach ball is a little bit heavier. And so they aren't able to adjust uh, yet, typically. Uh, and so that's what's nice is it's at their level. If you want to make it more difficult, changing up the, 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 the ball to a beach ball or a volleyball but I also feel that you may not be so comfortable playing volleyball inside the house. So that's why the, the, the balloon is a nice uh, alternative. So that's a really great one um, for that they can play for a while. And as I move along to somewhere inside, this is where you may have a bit more space. Uh, could be a basement, could be a living space that you rearrange some furniture to, uh, to accommodate. Um, or just general space around the, uh, around the house. And the, the inside games um, lean a little bit more on younger kids. The outside games are a little bit more on older. Um, and I selected them this way mainly so that um, I felt comfortable with supervision. If I'm thinking of a 10 year old, you know, I feel comfortable, I guess. I'm gonna speak for everyone to say that they can be a little bit more outside independently um, with a little bit less supervision than, you know, a five year old. Um, and then therefore maybe the five-year-old may need to stay a little bit closer to you as you're trying to complete your work day. Um, and so this one is another one that's inside. Uh, all you need is dryer sheets and they put the dryer sheets on the ground. The other thing I guess you need is not a carpeted surface. So anything else really works and uh, off they go. An obstacle course would work really well here. Uh, you know, maybe a figure skating routine or a speed skating routine. Um, tag if there's multiple players would be great. Um, and so this was a fun one. Uh, we didn't do this one, but this is a fun one. Um, I can imagine uh, because again, it's, it's quick, it's easy and stuff that you have lying around the house. Um, toilet paper bowling. Uh, this one made the cut. Uh, you can smile toilet paper, right? Um, I feel like the supply chain of toilet paper has stabilized. So I feel comfortable that you can have, I don't want to say excess toilet paper, but toilet paper enough to be able to play the game. Um, the variations are endless. You know, this is a structure that you can try and hit down with another toilet paper from a distance. Um, you know, you can change it a little bit to throwing for those that are a little bit older. Again, given the right amount of space and setup and comfort uh, of, of whoever, you could set it up on a table and they have to try and knock it down. Picture sort of a carnival setup um, for that one. And then and or bowling, a uh, really great activity for the whole family even. Uh, sometimes it's just as fun just to set up the pyramid. So that might be the game in itself. Next one is hallway soccer. Uh, and it is what, you th what the words say. Uh, so a party balloon or a beach ball, again, just for safety and uh, keeping the house uh, standing. Uh, two people is needed for this one. 
so use the hallway to play soccer. And so this is just a picture I found online. I think you get the concept. What's nice about the hallway in terms of uh, the game or the activity is, you know, the ability to, to sort of bank a shot off the wall or off the ceiling, even if, uh, if they want to. And so that makes it very fun. And again, contained in a way to a space, um, which I think is a goal often when we're in a situation of trying to stay active and move at home. It's nice to be able to say, this is where they're at. So that one's a great one. If I transition now to some, in a way, outside or different kinds of spaces, um, garage, stairway, and driveway, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. I hope you don't hear me <laughs> uh, swallowing, I guess. Um, I apologize, I realize um, that you probably can, but my mouth is getting a bit dry. So, uh, okay. Uh, and again, keep the uh, chat going, keep the questions going. If you have, I'm watching my time here. So we're getting, uh, we're getting there. So uh, garage, stairway, driveway, stairball, really great activity. Um, doesn't need to be inside stairs, could be outside stairs, could be park. Sometimes parks have staircases. Um, and so that could work tennis ball, two people, one at the top, one at the bottom. And essentially what they try and do is score on each other by getting the ball to go past them. Um, What's nice is when the ball kind of banks differently off the stairs and forces a different bounce for the, the kid at the bottom. Uh, it often becomes a fun thing to try and stop the ball. Really great activity for throwing, for catching. Uh, and again, with a tennis ball, typically you're looking at someone that's a little bit older. Uh, if you wanted to make it a little bit more for younger kids, a beach ball or a bigger ball is a little bit easier for them to, to manipulate. Yet a tennis ball is much more for, I'm going to say, let's say nine, eight, nine, ten and up um successfully so keep that in mind that's a great one stair ball garage ball another one where you need two people uh this one could be outside doesn't have to be over a garage it could be over a car it could be over a shed it could be over uh, a chalet at the park one person stands on one side one kid stands on one side one kid stands on the other and they throw the ball over the shed or over the garage or over the fence uh, or whatever it might be, the chalet, and they have to try and catch it. Honesty is key with this one. So they are able to obtain a point if when I throw it over, the person I'm playing with doesn't catch the ball, then I get a point um, and vice versa. But again, honesty is key here. So if you know your kids, as I mentioned before, and you know they'll be bickering, um, maybe you know tread water lightly and, uh, and preliminarily uh, explain the honesty is key in this one uh, to avoid any sort of intervention that's needed um, but a great one to work on throwing and catching another one here that's good on a driveway uh, and good on a hot day uh, with a water hose so if you have regular municipal sort of objects I guess like a recycling bin a green bin a garbage a garbage bin and a hose that's not too far um, this one I kind of got from uh, the old school American Gladiators TV show that I used to watch as a kid. And that idea of evading, typically I think they would throw a Nerf ball or something. And so they had these big structures that you could hide behind. And I was moving the green bin and the blue bin one day and the hose was out and I went, set this up. So we had a good time with this one. Um, and, uh, and I know that this one would be fun if you have the right setup. One thing I would caution is to be the person in charge of the hose. Because <laughs> um, uh, I tried it the other way and I got soaked. <laughs> it was good, it was hot, but um, then there was just a fight over the hose and whatever. Anyway, um, so yes, super fun one. If I go now to uh, backyard or field, uh, what's really nice is there's some more individual. So if you're thinking, okay, I need an individual outside one, Tim, for my 10 year old, this one's a nice one. So um, again, I have all the written information here, but I think the picture helps as I explain more. And so the kid could stand underneath the tree. This would be a great tree to play this game. Um, you need a tennis ball and a tree and you throw the ball up into the tree and watch it fall. And the best part is, is you have no idea if it's going to fall down without hitting a branch or hitting a branch. And the objective, if you're playing alone is to try and catch it. Um, if you're playing with two or more, a game or competition could be incorporated where, um, you know, I throw it and my brother or sister or friend has to catch it. And if they don't, then I get the point. And then they would do the same thing. And if I don't catch it, then they get the point. <clears throat> um, 
to me, this is a great way to incorporate using the space that you have and work, working on throwing and catching. Um, and again, what can be played for, depending on the kid, uh, five minutes or could be five hours, depending on, uh, on their interest. And what would be nice is even keeping a tally of how many they're able to get. This is another one um, that uh, was, is a nice one. It's multiple families. At the beginning of COVID, I remember there was, uh, in many neighborhoods, scavenger hunts where you'd walk around the neighborhood and look in the window for different items. Every few days it changed and it was a great initiative. I don't know where it started. Uh, probably from the ground up, probably a parent giving, um, giving an idea of how to keep the kids moving or get out of the house and move around. And so I thought of, okay, what can we do to one up that in a way? And so uh, we did this with some friends, uh, families. And so you go around the neighborhood and then lean on families that are part of your neighborhood as well. And you take selfies. So it's very 2020, uh, 21st century around different landmarks in the neighborhood that other kids would be able to identify. And so um, obviously with the use of a parent for this one, you then send the pictures to the other family, the kids look at the pictures and they have to figure out where are those landmarks that their friends were at. And then either walking, biking, running, uh, rollerblading, whatever it is, move to those places, retake the same pictures, uh, and then do you know a certain number of more pictures with different landmarks. And so it was really great. This one lasted a few weeks uh, between three families. And uh, it was nice, it was a forced, you know, let's get out of the house and have a destination versus let's just go for a walk with dog or whatever it might be. So um, this one, I, from experience, this one we did do and um, it was getting them outside, it was great. Frisbee tip, I'm watching my time here. Okay, we're closing in. Frisbee tip, uh, this one does require four more uh, of an older crowd, maybe 10 and up, and uh, does require more than four people. So again, I tried to give a wide variety um, so if there's kids in the neighborhood or siblings, this is a great activity. And so you have two teams. The objective is to throw the Frisbee back and forth from one side of the space to the other. And the teams are all kind of standing close together like you have here. Um, if I use this picture uh, a little bit uh, as an inspiration to also say something I mentioned before, which is obviously this can be done as a family. Uh, and so you, from one side, one team throws the Frisbee to the other side to the other team. And the objective of that team is to tip the Frisbee and then catch it by uh, somebody else. So the Frisbee will be coming towards the team. One person has to try and tip it with their hand and then someone else on the team has to try and catch it. If that is successful, then the one point is achieved. If it's unsuccessful, then no point is achieved. And then you throw the Frisbee back to the other team. It can continue for many, many rounds. Um, and it's a nice way to incorporate throwing of a Frisbee, which is a good skill, as well as catching, and then sort of a teamwork or strategy um, uh, as well with it. So super fun game in a nice uh, open space, backyard or park. Three more, three more to go here, and then I got some concluding uh, comments. So um, street chalk is another thing that I think is a staple, which is included in my final uh, couple of slides is like something to really you no, know, go out and get if you can, uh, if you don't have, because it's a great tool to just spontaneously do something um, and have them sp spontaneously do something. So this is nice. It can be done for one, can be done for more. It's street chalk. It may require you a little bit to tap into some creativity um, or use the internet or Pinterest to drum up a maze. Uh, but something like this is a great uh, activity for the kids. Uh, and then can in a way get lost in it. Um, what's nice is depending on your kid, they may be in and out of the maze in 30 seconds and then be like, okay, hey, now what? And you're like, I just spent three hours <laughs> putting this down on the cement. Um, so here are some tips or here are some ways to add levels. And so you can hide treasure in the maze. So it doesn't always mean get out. It means go get the treasure and then get out. Uh, treasure could be just a tennis ball or another small object. Um, you can play Pac-Man. So if you have more than one person, more than one kid, you can play Pac-Man and one person is the Pac-Man trying to chase the others and the others have to make their way through the maze um, so as real life as possible. Tag is another great one in the, in the maze. And we're incorporating different kinds of movement, you know, skipping, jumping, hopping uh, versus just running or walking. Uh, that could be really, done, really fun as well. Uh, another really quick way, if you have two people, 
one person is blindfolded, the other person is on the side using their voice to try and get them to move through the maze. So five steps straight, two steps right, you know, four steps to the left or whatever it might be. Uh, and so these are all ways to add levels or use the same thing that took you a few hours to put together and not have it uh, be done with if you can uh, within five minutes. In the same way, a massive snakes and ladders game is a really great way to have something set up. Um, again, depending on the age, they may be interested in playing this for a long time, getting all the way to the end. Uh, you know, having a pair of dice that you may have at home if, from a board game or sometimes at the dollar store, they have a large uh, pair of dice that you can have or purchase <clears throat> uh, is a great way to get them doing stuff. Now it's not, yes, they may not break a sweat, but they're outside and they're moving um, and they're incorporating some strategy involved in it as well. Obviously there's lots of luck, but uh, it gets them outside and moving. This is not a picture that I did. This is uh, did. This is from uh, the internet. So someone's very good at uh, lines. <laughs> and uh, a lot. Another one. Last one with uh, chalk and street. Um, you know, if, if access to a bicycle, uh, it's a great way to get them physically moving, uh, and obviously creating an obstacle course that um, uh, on the street, in a bike or on a bike, as well as even just the inside obstacle course, putting it outside. Um, uh, with street chalk instead of painter's tape is a great way to do and get them moving outside. Um, one of the things I saw on the internet, I guess, or social media at one point, there was a neighborhood that did it on their sidewalk and people were doing it um, as they were passing by. Strangers were doing it. It was great. Um, I don't know where. It's something that, you know, flies by and you went, oh, that's a really good idea. Um, so I can't tell you exactly where I saw that, but I saw that. And uh, so that stuff like that works great uh, as well too. And I think what's nice is knock on wood, it doesn't rain um, for a few days. It can be done um, periodically throughout, uh, throughout the week, I guess. So um, the last section, I'm just closing in on time. I see there's some chat, I'm excited to read it uh, in a second. I don't think there's anything that I need to address uh, right away because I told uh, uh, Roberta to uh, interrupt me for something specific. Um, so as we're closing in here, I'd like to uh, encourage you to ask questions about some of the activities or strip away some of the activities and ask questions about, <clears throat> you know, I'm in this situation, I have this, what can I do? Uh, I'd love that. That would be great if we could, as a group, think of ways to help solve um, some of your dilemmas that maybe the list of activities or uh, the, you know, conversation didn't uh, address uh, that you specifically have, because I think that'd be fabulous. Uh, before we do that, or as we're doing that, I did want to conclude a little bit with uh, a few things. Um, as you can probably see, painter's tape is a nice thing to have around the house. Um, and again, I mentioned this at the dollar store, they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, tennis balls uh, are great as well, as well. Dollar store ones work fine for many of the things that we were doing. Street chalk uh, and a beach ball or a ball of that size, maybe it's a balloon, um, to do the, some of the activities. Those are great things to have around the house so that you can grab uh, if you need. Um, and so uh, these are things that I encourage you to look. Maybe you have them, uh, and if not, um, go ahead and get them if you're looking to incorporate some of these things. I see there's a question coming through, so I'll look at it in a sec. I'll make two more points. So um, I think the other thing I wanted to potentially inspire you to do a little bit um, and not, I didn't want you walking away being like, well, it's so easy for him. He's got the background and the experience. Uh, I wanted you maybe to feel more inspired and maybe try and say, yeah, I'll take what, you know, an expert has done as an expert has been able to do um, being from phys ed. And like I said, all the camp experience that I've had um, and get inspired to kind of look at things outside the box and know that it doesn't take, again, you know, your kids more than anyone, but from my experience, it doesn't take often the shiniest, most expensive uh, item at a store to get them interested in moving. It's sometimes just how you set it up or how you package it or how you, you know, kind of try and uh, organize it. So thinking outside the box, stuff that you have around the house, <clears throat> excuse me, and knowing your kid, I think are, are the things I wanted to mention there. And like I said, use what you have. Um, so I'm going to go, mm -hmm. so, a question, parent of an only child here, some of the, these games are doable, but was just looking for more. One of the challenges we had during COVID was always one of us had to stop, yes. So I get that. And I was wanted to say one more thing. Um, so this is to, to Jackie. Um, I have a comment, I totally, totally relate. 
um, depending on the kid, uh, our own specifically and the mood that they're in. Sometimes they were just needed a little nudge and they were able to sort of entertain themselves uh, through movement or even without movement, you know, doing some sort of more low active arts and crafts kind of thing. Um, but there were days when it was like, you, you did this yesterday why can't you do it today? <laughs> like, I need you more to do it alone today than I did yesterday. Murphy's Law, obviously. So um, for me, the biggest thing is the preparation a little bit. <clears throat> As a teacher, preparation does go a long way. I know this is adding potentially one more to everyone's plate, but if a system could be, um, like a routine, I guess, could, could be developed maybe in the evening, it's probably the last thing we all feel like doing. But one of the things I think is advice is, you know, think of the day next day and have some of these tool, tool kit activities ready so that if some of them don't have someone else to play with and they need to play with you, modifying a little bit to, so that they can play with by themselves, um, leaning on, um, you know, things that, uh, I'm trying to think like balloon volleyball, for instance, may not be as fun, obviously without somebody, but using it against a wall might be, might work. You know, that alphabet challenge could be a way to kind of do both. Um, I don't have the immediate, immediate solution. Sometimes, um, it comes just from trial and error that you are able to find what works for your kid. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but <coughs> excuse me, but um, feel free to type it in or obviously use the microphone to ask uh, another question or follow-up question, Jackie. Um, Tim, we have mm -hmm. another question from Hannah. Okay. In here. Yep. Um, I don't know if you see it. Yeah, I do. Okay. Do you have any suggestions or for physical based activities that can be done directed over Zoom? Um, I guess I have a follow-up question to that question. So use the chat, I suppose. Um, uh, do I understand your question to be like, I have one person who's able to guide something over Zoom to someone else? And I'm thinking one is an adult potentially and one is a kid or is it kid to kid? Adult to kids. So things that um, I know work, uh, Anything fitnessy, dancey, yoga like, uh, if they're interested in that, that could be something super fun. Um, one of the things that our kids did, our older one specifically, who's in elementary school, when she was on, you know, her Zoom, not her class Zoom calls in a sense, but more, you know, a Zoom date with a friend. Um, one of the things that they thought of themselves was a version of a scavenger hunt that isn't, you know, physical movement um, in a phys ed kind of way, but definitely just got them up and moving around. And so they would be like, find me um, a banana peel. <laughs> and then our kid would get up and go get a banana peel. And then she'd come back and be like, find me a paper clip. And they'd go up and come back. So it kind of got them moving a little bit, uh, depending on the setup, because um, we don't have endless tablets and endless phones and endless whatever. So they were on one of our phones typically. And, um, and so they moved around with the phone. That was something I can share right away. The mirror me game I see came through. It's a really great thing as well. Like a Simon says kind of thing that works really great. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else on the fly here. I know that like a freeze dance like that, that comes to mind uh, or using hip hop or music, I shouldn't just say hip hop, music in general. Um, we did that with some cousins um, that worked really well and even the parents were getting into it. So, but again, unsupervised, I think they could potentially do that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question specifically. Feel free others. This is what's great about this platform is um, to incorporate more conversation. So I'm going through, I see there's another question. From Farley? Yeah. That one or yeah. yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how to modify activities for a client with visual impairment? Great question. Um, I guess some of the ones I explained, um, I, I've talked about the alphabet challenge. I'll bring it up again. Um, I mean, I'm going to trust that the client, that you have uh, the experience to know how to modify certain things. So I would imagine then that those letters need to be a bit bigger if it's impairment. Um, Cause a lot of the stuff is throwing and catching. I get that object manipulation. It can be difficult. This, what I can come back to, I guess, to, to maybe leave you with uh, for that one 
is the size of the object. Um, one of the things we did, in, I can think back into uh, when I was in university, we played a uh, goal ball, I believe it's called. And it's a ball with a bell inside. And so that helped, um, that, that could help for sure, a, a ball that has a sound um, to guide to where it is. Um, the size of the object might, and the color of the object might uh, aid uh, the student, the person, the kid, in its ability or their ability uh, to do the activity. Um, anything that involves throwing can be modified to rolling. That could be something as well. Um, so if I think of the, 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 the toilet paper game, the rolling of the toilet paper game, um, you know, I mentioned throwing, I wouldn't do it throwing or the alphabet game uh, or, you know, the tree ball game might be very difficult, uh, but modifying that to, you know, using a driveway where the ball has to roll down and they have to be able to adapt and find it. Um, that could be something else that, that could work. I'm doing this on the fly, so you, it's a good question. <laughs> As you can see, when you, it's funny how humans are, right? When we start to think, we look up, you're getting down to that deeper layer of thought. Um, feedback is welcome to, too, by the way. I'd love that uh, if there was feedback. I have one more concluding comment to make. I know we're, we're trying to make it uh, an hour or so, so I'm six minutes over. <clears throat> As my driver and led me. We started a bit late, Tim, so there you go, yeah. we're good. We're good okay. for another five minutes. Okay, good. I'll fill it. <laughs> um, so any more questions come in? I did want to mention, um, like I said, I think the, my big, I've been thinking about this for a while. Alice approached me a few weeks ago now, so um, I haven't had a lot of time to think, but I guess a lot of time to think. Funny. Um, I didn't want you to feel that I, I hope this didn't come off this way, that uh, a lot of the pictures, because there, there are a bit of, of my kids and stuff, that, um, and here they come now. They have to go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> and go to, then go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess you can relate. Um, uh, that it's perfect here, because it's not. We struggle a lot. and. Uh, and yes, we may have a bit of experience in the movement aspect of things. We don't have experience in other things. So, um, and some of the pictures we did stage, I needed a picture of this weird random activity that we may have done, but I didn't take a picture of. Uh, and so I was scrambling over the past few days. I was like, I should show some visuals. So I didn't want that to come off and I hope it didn't. It's not all um, tea and, you know, biscuits over here. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I said at the beginning, I'm exhausted. So I hope you all relate to that too. Um, yet I do feel that uh, one of the things I want you to, I hope you take away from uh, this is a little bit of preparation, a little bit of extra toolkit stuff, uh, a little bit of um, creativity and, um, and knowing your kid, um, I think is key, uh, uh, can, can help get through these times. Again, with the goal of moving as much as possible to get them to become more physically literate uh, and replace in a sense what we do in the school or what we do on the field or in the ice or in the pool and um, as best as possible. It's, we're not asking for the world, obviously, but um, anything, anything, anything helps. Uh, where are you want to have my twin boys? That's a great, uh, I don't know. <laughs> been fun. Um, so I had this uh, two things last to bring up. Um, that I can't help but share if inspired to do some of these things. And if you are doing them with them, because I think that's something nice to do uh, if and when possible, knowing the topic of the last webinar was uh, play um, and the importance of play um, is the cueing. Cueing is immensely important in helping them become more physically literate. If you think of reading again, if they're reading the wrong word, we can typically correct them and say, well, no, that's a you know silent G or whatever it might be. And so it's the same thing with movement. If they step with the same side uh, that they throw, if I'm throwing with my right and I step with my right, you try and correct that and say, step with your left. Will you know all these all of these corrections off by heart? No, I don't know them either. Um, but if ever you're feeling inspired, there's a great, very specific one sheet uh, for many of the movements uh, that are going to be done in some of the activities uh, that I showed. 
and other basic activities that you can use um, if ever you feel inspired to do so. So that's there for you. There are some uh, really, really, really great resources that uh, share lots and lots of information on all of their platforms, obviously their website, but also Instagram and Facebook. Uh, some are local like Champions for, Champions for Life. Uh, and then some are more national like the last uh, three. Uh, and so take, if you have the time, if you have the energy, uh, take the time. It's great. They've got lots of stuff for parents, for educators, for uh, rec leaders, whatever it might be. And lots of these games in a similar way that are formatted, uh, how I formatted them. So very specific, easily tangible. What do I need to do? What are the instructions, uh, et cetera. And so those are great resources. And I guess the last thing I wanted to share was just sort of that feeling of um, promise, I guess, that, uh, that one of the feelings I had when all this happened was that 7, bi 7 billion people were gonna be doing mobilizing together. So uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in this sort of, we are a small world yet a big world and we've never felt so small yet so polarized. Uh, if you take a look at what's going on. And so um, yet uh, it's through things like this uh, that I feel confidence in us as, as humans to, to get through difficult times, different times and new routines. And so I have a, a little bit of an expertise in this and I can't wait to, to attend another webinar that many of you will give about things that I need to learn about. And, um, and I'm humbled to be here and thank you. Hopefully it was fun. <laughs> And uh, hopefully you were able to relax and take away some of the things that, um, uh, that you needed to help you tomorrow and or as soon as you do. And so as a community, thank you. As a person, thank you. Um, and, uh, and good luck. <laughs> and give yourself a hug. Give yourself oh. a hug. Uh, oh, wow. On behalf of the MCLD team, we want to thank you for the very important topic of moving through COVID times, fun ways uh, of keeping children active. Thank you for stating that you know your child, your kids best. Yeah. That is very important. Yeah. The recipe you provided in terms of time, child's mood, supervision, equipment and space, the games and activities that you shared with us tonight. Uh, I know that many people will uh, benefit from your expertise and the information you provided. Uh, we really, really thank you. Thank you. That's thank nice. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everyone. We will be closing down the webinar shortly.